NetRootsRadio.com presents David Waltman, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waltman. All right, good morning, everybody. It's Friday. We're back on the air live. This is actually, uh, what's today's date? It's Friday, December 27th. 2013, I'm holding up a copy of today's newspaper so you can understand clearly that I have been kidnapped by Daily Coast and forced to do this radio show live. Uh, That's not actually how it worked. Uh, Of course, it was voluntary. But uh, I am, uh, well, I don't know. Look, it is uh, December 27th. It is live. We're no longer playing the classic shows, except that we're going to start doing it again next week. (laughs) But we'll try and do the same schedule. At the very least, uh, a Monday and Friday show uh, to send you off into the holiday week of next week. Yes, it is a holiday. Uh, War on New Year's Eve starts today. And we'll take a couple days off, hang out with the kids, have a little New Year's celebration, and be back for a Friday recap just like this week. Uh, My uh, desktop PC informs me that it's time to get Windows 8.1 for free, which looks like bad news since Windows 8.0 was such a fun disaster. Every new update is a disaster, so I always look at every update as a uh, potential uh, debacle. And, well, hey, uh, so I think I'll, uh, remind me later there, Mr. Computer, and we'll talk again. There was also an update of the, what do you call it, NiceCast uh, program that I use to actually bring in this show. Of course, it delivers that at uh, 8.59 and asks, would you like to update now? No, I think I'll wait on that too. All right. So here we are facing a, another Friday and the end of 2013, which by all accounts has been, oh, I don't know, uh, one of, it's definitely the latest year we've had. Of all the years we've had, this is one of them and it's almost over. So <clears throat> as we try to wind it up and I think try and avoid uh, the trite recaps of 2013, I was there. I don't know if you were, so I didn't really need to be reminded of the things that happened during this year. It seems like it was just yesterday within you know, plus or minus 364 days that XYZ happened. Yes, well, I know that and you don't really need to remind me of it. Kids are home today, so they may be rattling around in the background. Same will go for next Monday. By Friday next week, they're back at school. How would you like to have that as your school schedule? It's you're off for this week, and then you're off through Wednesday of next week. And that's a nice break, but going back Thursday, for Thursday and Friday, I don't know how much is going to get done. The, the whole school system is going to go and play solitaire. The old uh, thing that you used to do, of course, in a situation like that is Minesweeper. Now that... People are on Windows 8.0. Is there Minesweeper anymore? Does that still exist? Is that so ancient that it doesn't make any sense? Just sort of uh, curious about that one. Lou DePage says he updated three PCs to Windows 8.1 with no glitches. So there you are. There you have it. Anecdotes, of course, uh, not actually uh, the, uh, what, the singular. Of the, I've reversed that saying that. Greg gives me all the time. Data, not the plural of anecdotes. But that's plural right there. Three PCs. So that's data as far as I'm concerned. Uh, also, I have questions about that one. I know a stati- statistician can actually explain it. And if they do explain the joke, it's no longer funny. But if the plural of anecdotes is not data, uh, well, it's interesting to me. Because each anecdote is, of course, a data point. And if you collect a whole bunch of them, like in the plural, that's data, I think, right? Or do I misunderstand the definition? All right. Well, anyway, we'll get to explaining and uh, stomping that joke to death perhaps sometime later. If Greg can join us later on today, I don't want to set the agenda for your segment, Greg, but uh, I have just set the agenda for your segment. All right. Uh, right, and Bill uh, in Portland, Maine says, no, no Minesweeper, no Solitaire, Windows 8 sucks. See, I knew there was a reason why everyone hated it so much, beside the fact that you can't find anything anymore. They, uh, if you are a Mac person, well, you know what I was going to tell you? Oh, if you're a Mac person, here's what happened to Windows Point. You don't care. <laughs> the whole reason you're a Mac person is that you don't have to know what happens in Windows anything, point, whatever. So I won't bother you with that. But they did change everything. 
Uh, I thought I'd get the latest Windows when I replaced my hard drive in the PC, and uh, it's kind of a mistake because I can't find anything. I don't do as much on the PC as I do on the Mac, so I, I'm not going to get practice. But, yeah, there's something weird about the way Windows Point 8 does everything. There's a million features, and I don't know what they are, and I can't use them. All I want to know is where's my desktop, and that's not even an easy question to answer in Windows 8. So, to me, that's fail. But, you know, when when 9.0 comes, everyone will be crying, where's my Windows 8? I want a Windows 8 emulator. So, uh, it's, all, you know, it's all a matter of time with this stuff. All right, so what has happened over the past couple of days? Well, there was a Christmas, and everyone celebrated Jesus' birthday, which I think is probably in the wrong place in the calendar, but lots of uh, better biblical scholars than I have uh, already debated that one. And, uh, you know, I did see a lot of uh, interesting commentary on Christmas, the war on Christmas, uh, you know, commercialization of Christmas, all that. It just typically goes along with the season. I saw somebody observe, I think properly, but I'm not Christian, so I'll leave it to those of you who are to debate this. But I thought a good point. Uh, a lot of the crying about commercialization or over, I don't know what, celebration, I guess, of Christmas, as opposed to observing it as a solemn religious holiday, seems misplaced to me. I mean, from the outside, Easter seems like that's the miracle. That's the one that should be the big, big thing. And that's the one that if you're going to, if you want to have a solemn holiday, although that should be a pretty joyous holiday, I would think. But uh, if you want to have a, a holiday that's celebrated you know, in church and with no goofiness and to make something the biggest holiday of the year, that would be it. To me, I would say Easter, that, I mean, that's the topper of the miracles. The guy was born, virgin birth, yes, but the, okay, so if you want, do you want to have that party nine months prior? That would be okay, although that's a little freaky. And who knows whether they needed nine months gestation for a virgin birth. I don't know about these things. It could have been instantaneous, for all I know. But she had to at least have spent a few days knowing she was pregnant, right? So they could be wandering around looking for a, an inn. Anyway, uh, I thought Easter was the place to put the emphasis. And that would leave Chris, Christmas free for all the partying, which is what we do now. And, and everybody feels guilty about it. We're commercializing it. It's too much of a party. There's too much hype, etc. But this is a birthday party. It should be hype. And this way you can feel good about having a great, fun time. You can celebrate Christmas exactly the same way. You can love it the most, but don't have to feel guilty that you're not being super religious about it. Be super religious about the miracle in April, I think. And uh, I don't know. I think that solves probably no problems, but... I thought it was worth pointing out. I thought a good observation. And, uh, you know, what, who am I to tell you which miracle is the, the most amazing? It's not up to me. I just thought that was an interesting thing. And I thought this would free everybody up to have a good time and stop worrying about, oh, my God, I went to an office party and Xeroxed my naked butt during this miraculous celebration. Don't do it at Easter. No one does, right? And I've never seen anybody do it at Easter. Is there a drink that people drink at Easter that's alcoholic? I mean, alcoholics, I guess, drink alcoholic drinks all the time. But eggnog, and, and maybe and maybe that's just overstating the effect or impact of eggnog, too. I don't think people are getting drunk on eggnog at office parties and then copying their butts. There's other stuff. All right. Well, at any rate, uh, I don't know. I think that uh, I, I just wanted people to have a good time and, and have, be able to enjoy themselves, including... I guess, although, I, again, I discourage this, but who am I to say? Giving people guns as gifts. I thought that was a little bit weird, and there was an awful lot of that going on, and I thought, birthday of the Prince of Peace, time for a gun. That seemed kind of strange to me, but people like to give gifts. And, of course, I, typically the people who give, I think, I'm guessing, who give the gift of a gun at Christmas think they are giving peace to one another. See, no one will bother you if you have one of these. And there's an awful lot of it going on. It was an interesting weekend. It wasn't even a weekend. It felt like a weekend to watch the pictures being tweeted around of people uh, posing with their new guns that they had gotten for Christmas. And I was a little more than a little concerned with the number of people who insisted on posing with their fingers 
inside the trigger guard on the trigger, which uh, if you did that, if you got your first gun and did that, the gun enthusiasts, the kind of people who would tell you, uh, you said clip rather than magazine, so you're out, you're not allowed to debate this anymore, would be screaming at you. Everybody knows you don't put your finger inside the trigger guard. They were uh, trashing one or another of the uh, gun policy ads on TV because the actor portraying the gun enthusiast who was supposedly in support of background checks put his finger inside the trigger guard, and so that would prove that he was clearly not a real gun enthusiast. And you'd be surprised how many not real gun enthusiasts got very enthusiastic about the guns that they were given over Christmas, so much so that they couldn't wait to put their fingers inside the trigger and tweet pictures around of themselves doing that. So I'm, I'll be looking for them in the headlines in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, Greg Dworkin joins us. Good morning, Greg. How are you? How is? Did you have a little break, too? A little bit of a break. Uh, you know, it, uh, we had actually a pretty good time. Uh, I had a, a wedding to go to. It's Ooh. somebody who is now uh, in their 20s who I took care of when they were eight or nine years old and grew up and got well and All right. invited me to the wedding, and that was cool. And I, nice. I so much more enjoy weddings than funerals, and, and you know, that's, yeah. that's how it goes. Well, people like them a lot more. and so I know people that job. enjoy funerals more than weddings, but they're they're kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're a strange bunch. And, uh, you know, well, look, uh, sometimes... Uh, oh, there are movies about that. But. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Well, uh, and some uh, movies, uh, they, they go hand in hand. So, all right. And uh, do you have some good Chinese food or just maybe a different sort of feast this year? I'm interested. No, in we, we, saw, we saw The Hobbit Part 2, Hobbit, Desolation good. of Smog, and uh, then Chinese food, traditional uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish uh, Christmas, and that was uh, a great deal of fun. I love Christmas because it's the time of year where uh, my holiday is already done, and I get to go to all my neighbor's uh, uh, celebrations and yeah. they do all the work and it's wonderful. It's a pretty good thing. I like it. Uh, they worked well together, which is sort of how it happened. So uh, yeah, it is nice. It's nice to be able to enjoy it. It's quiet. People. It are is a small town. You fires. get to go caroling with them. You know, you learn stuff you otherwise didn't know. I remember uh, when we originally got our our little modest uh, raised ranch house about uh, twenty five years ago and. We were uh, first inspecting it from the outside, and I, I said to the realtor showing us the home, uh, so, okay, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, but what are all these little hooks outside the door here that go up one side over the top and then down the other side? I don't get that. And they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, you don't know what those are? And I said, uh, no. Um, didn't have them in my apartment in Manhattan. I, I'm not really sure. And, of course, those are the hooks to hang Christmas lights, which... I had never done. Yeah. And still done. But, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it who knew? I didn't know. You, things you learn. I, I learned, again, moving out to the exurbs from uh, uh, New York City, that, uh, you know, in New York, when you lose your power, you still have water because you have all those water tanks on the top of the building and everything right. runs by gravity. But if you lose power out in Connecticut, uh, there's no water because there's no well pump. Right. And I never really understood this properly. I mean, they're like, uh, you know, different elements, you know. Fire or wind and water. And if you lose one, why do you not have the other? You know, they're opposites. Right. Okay. And so after the first one happened, you're like, "Well, we lost power. Why is it windy? What's happening here? Where's the wind? Who's got the fan on? I don't know." Uh, well, okay. Uh, yeah. So the hooks. Yeah, that's funny too because I uh, I sort of had this. I might have guessed maybe what they were just because I've seen so much of it, but uh, well, yeah, if I they didn't bought realize. the house in December, I would have known. Oh you yeah, know. right. Then it would have tipped you off. Summer. That's true, too. I didn't realize that there were permanently installed hooks. All the, well, I guess not everybody. I always did wonder after uh, seeing some of these displays, like, okay, well, what do they do? They, they can't staple a wire up there. You can't nail it. What are they doing? How are they attaching this stuff? Post-its. <laughs> right, glue sticks. <laughs> and, Enormous yeah, glue number sticks of and, and, Elmer's glue right, sticks. Right, and just, just hope it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get to I guess so. Anything. Well, all right. Well, that yeah, that is a great story. I think that I'll be thinking about that. I'll have to when I'm out looking for. I'll be looking for a zesty ranch home, by the way, not a modest ranch home, but that it's similar, I think. And I'll see if there are any hooks there. All right. Well, so and and uh, so the movie review is pretty simple. It was a pretty good movie, and if anybody uh, wants to go see it, just don't expect it to be like the book because it wasn't. Oh well, it rarely is. But, uh, but it, is this one? Not the one that's not quite derived from the book, or yeah, I mean it's too long to 
you'd be done with the movie, uh, you know, in about 20 minutes if you did it from the book. So they had to add stuff. Oh, okay. So they added a, a, an elvish female character that didn't exist and a couple of oh, events that didn't happen. And, you know, it, it's okay. It was a pretty good action movie. Okay. Well, so many of our stories in our culture always have a little, just a little bit added to uh, what actually happened. And that's what makes them exciting. And sometimes we have holidays about them later on. So. Absolutely, well you know, done. and uh, well done. And, and of course, a uh, couple of things to point out here in terms of summarizing uh, uh, data, you know. And, and, and see, data is uh, information that mm. you can uh, process. And okay. that's why anecdotes and data don't go together. You can't process anecdotes. doesn't so, matter how many you have. Okay, so uh, it's just data. That you, it's, it's anecdotes you can process or it's numbers you can You can't what, process you can, anecdotes. I you, mean, it's, what do you, you do say with it? it. It's interesting. You add it to your data so that it makes it okay. more interesting. But so what, you have to have a you have to code your anecdotes and you say well you don't because it's just there for interest you know they don't oh. really mean anything and you can't add them up but uh, data points you can so uh, so it's, what happens to it how what, you can't turn an anecdote into a data point by saying all right well, that guy got shot i heard about that let's put that in my database Push well it depends one. what it is you're looking at but mm-hmm. you you have to you have to process it further you can't use it as is okay. and you can't and you can't uh, extrapolate from it in any uh, meaningful All right. sense. That we can understand. Okay, but that's just because it, it, by itself it's not statistically significant. Well, you don't know what's in it, and you, know, you don't know if it's true, and you don't. You, you got to pick out the points about it that you want to turn into data points that you can then extrapolate. But you know that's how it goes. You see, data right. data is interesting. Data in and of itself is interesting. The word is interesting. It's both a singular and a plural, depending upon how you use it. Right. And so people can yell at you and say, "You said data when you meant datum." But, no, actually, uh, it really can be used in a whole lot of different ways. So kind of interesting word there. Like moose. Or, or meese, yeah, exactly, uh, which is the plural of moose. Right. So the plural of moose is not data either. Right. So, no. <laughs> so like, no. no. Nor is it mice. You right. Know, so because uh, they actually have a completely different meanings, which you would know if you ever tried to trap one. Yes. <laughs> they don't fit. They don't fit. Well, some don't fit in. Also, I'm not even sure so, they like cheese. Exactly. Well, uh, probably because in Connecticut they do anyway. I've never seen a moose in Connecticut. I've certainly seen them in Maine. Uh, we have bear. We have uh, cougars. We have mountain lions. But uh, not any wandering moose that I know of. Hmm. Or deer than you can shake a stick at if that's your idea of a good time. Uh, but, uh, you know. Uh, it, it, it's important to, to have an idea of, of the world around you, and that's why all these people who yell at you for uh, misdescribing the uh, firearm that uh, went off accidentally because yes. everybody knows gun enthusiasts never shoot themselves or each other. It just doesn't happen. Um, you know, it, it's well, important. The enthusiasm to goes away at that point. It does, because after that, you're by definition no longer enthusiastic about the whole process. <laughs> that's right. That's why we know no gun enthusiast has ever shot themselves. And that is a perfect example of why you can't use anecdotes to collect data. And there we have it. Okay. So, uh, yes, more about that later. But, uh, yeah, in the meantime, uh, what stories have uh, percolated? Well, I, I, something we've talked about on the show before. We got this fellow named uh, Brain Rap mm-hmm. who collects uh, uh, data points that you can process on uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, signups. And uh, we've mentioned him before on the air. He blogs over at Daily Coast. He has a daily diary there. And what was nice is that Sarah Cliff over at the Washington Post, Forbes magazine, uh, a bunch of other folks uh, have picked up on it and uh, uh, printed the chart that he puts together. Uh, And uh, it's really very nice to see him get that kind of recognition. And uh, we're at 5.75 million signups if you count uh, Medicaid and the – private signups, which uh, are almost uh, 2 million if you uh, go by his numbers. And so far, uh, they've been fairly accurate. We're not going to get the December numbers for everything that got signed up between uh, October 1st when the site wasn't working for the first six weeks and the second six weeks when it was. So December 23rd was the deadline. And sometime mid-January, we will get the actual numbers. But so far... uh, Charles Gobb is his name, and uh, Brain Rap is his handle. And so far, his tracking has actually been pretty accurate each month as they go back and say, okay, here are the official numbers. His have been uh, pretty spot on. So it's a, it's a useful guide as to what we're going to be seeing. And there's some you know, fascinating blowback and, and reaction to all of that 
which uh, I know from uh, Twitter discussions I've had with some conservatives uh, when we started talking about these numbers, and I was first exposed to what apparently is a conservative talking point that none of these numbers count because they haven't paid their premium yet. And ah. I'm still trying to figure out why that matters and why that's important. That is a good question. It, uh, but apparently to them it is because Freedom and Reagan. Yes. And, uh, and besides, some of these sign-ups are Medicaid and and. And in the end, your insurance company complained to a reporter, so none of it counts. It's, <laughs> I'll use that. it's, it's weird because uh, they're trying everything possible to deny the fact that lots of people are signing up, frankly, in the millions. And so there's going to be millions of people who get insurance who didn't have insurance before. And I can understand uh, saying it's not right because of the way that it's financed, and I can understand that you could say it's not right because some of it is mandatory and it's coercive. Mm -hmm. And I can understand you saying that it's really sloppy and it's disruptive, but I can't understand saying those numbers aren't real because I decided not to believe them and let me make up a bogus reason why. That just isn't going to fly and it's not going to hold. Yeah, uh, the so, logic behind it makes no sense. Uh, I'll remind right, them so, of it so, next time the taxes go up. No, they haven't. Have you paid yet? Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, I, we had this discussion, and, and all I was trying to say is I understand you don't like the law, but you really need to prepare yourself for the fact that the numbers are going to be quite more extensive than what you think because your point is that nobody's going to want this, and it's demonstrably untrue. Yeah. Millions do. But, but and, that, you know, but, mm. they, but they, that didn't fly because uh, Freedom and Reagan. Right. You know. So there was that. Uh, there was a wonderful article that uh, Christopher Flavel wrote in Bloomberg Opinion, uh, which uh, w w was kind of an editorialist uh, approach, you know, kind of truthy, uh, and, and pointed out uh, that a CNN poll, as he writes, as Christopher writes, a CNN poll taken last week showed that many Americans are exaggerating the effect of Obamacare on their own lives. And to, to Christopher, uh -huh. to the writer, this suggests, he says, the law will get a bump in public support over the next few months as the widely anticipated negative consequences don't materialize for most people outside of the health care ex exchanges. Because regardless of what you want to make fun of about what Obama said, if you have employer-based health insurance, none of this stuff about health care.gov affects you at all. Right. At all, in any way, and that's 80% of folks. So what Christopher writes is... Uh, the, the, the poll is interesting for another reason. It suggests the public's divergent views of Obamacare don't reflect different opinions about the proper role of government so much as wildly different understanding about what the law will mean for the average American. And here's the thing. They can't both be right. So he's going back to the CNN poll and says, start with this question. So, you know, this is how I sneak in a little polling here. Do you think you and members of your family will or will not be able to receive care from the same doctors you see now? And uh, Christopher Flavel, the author of this article, points out that isn't a question about political preferences. It's asking respondents to make a prediction of fact. And the difference is startling. 79% of Democrats say they'll be able to keep their doctor. 44% of Republicans, almost a two-to-one gap, say that they'll be able to keep their, go their doctor. So uh, Flavel's point is unless doctors start dropping patients according to their party affiliation, these two groups can't both be right. Here's another one. The same is true for a question about whether people expect to pay for medical, uh, pay more for medical care. In the article, he lifts out more. But ex you expect to pay for medical care. Everybody expects to pay for medical care, but are you going to pay more? Mm -hmm. Here the gap is even larger. 86% of Republicans said yes compared to with just 47% of, uh, of Democrats who said that. So unless insurers structure co-payments and deductibles by party, they can't both be right. Hmm. Either they are going to be paying more yes. or they're not. I would structure it that way, but that's why I'm not in the business. So, so he goes on to say, to speculate, one of two things is going to happen in 2014. Either access to doctors will fall and the cost of the care will go up for most Americans and Democrats will gradually realize they've been misled and support for the law will collapse, or access to doctors and the cost of care won't change for most Americans. Republicans will gradually realize they've been misled and the case against Obamacare will disintegrate for the average voter. Fear of that outcome may explain why Republican leaders have been so frantic in trying to undermine the law now. They're afraid that once the base realizes the warnings about Obamacare are wrong, they'll stop paying attention. Oh, no. So <laughs> That could happen. Or they'll start handing out Republican 
uh, blindfolds and say, just wear this when you go in for treatment, and you'll be able to truthfully tell the pollsters you weren't able to see the same doctor. It's like the unskewed pulse stuff, you know, or or having a cigarette holder and saying that uh, here I am staying away from cigarettes the way that my doctor told me to, an old joke. (laughs) And, you know, uh, yeah, you can have your own reality, but only for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the author of that piece is exactly right. It's unsustainable to make these ridiculous claims that just aren't holding up. And uh, we were talking about the ACA numbers. It's unsustainable to claim that people aren't interested in signing up because, in fact, they are. And I think that uh, one of those two groups is, in fact, wrong and that the whole thing about, oh, you have uh, Medicaid, your doctor won't see you. Well, I see – I'm a doctor, and I see Medicaid patients all the time. I think it's a bunch of crap. So, you know, there are certain circumstances where – uh, you may have trouble finding a doctor to treat X, Y, or Z because of uh, L, M, or N insurance. But that's the system now prior to Affordable Care Act. True. And many of the complaints that people make about ACA, particularly on the Republican side, are in fact indictments of the current health care system in the U.S. that have nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. And so if they want to make that argument and help support single payer, that's fine with me. But it's really a misdirection article uh, uh, argument that has nothing to do with what ACA did. Your premiums went up like that never happened before. They threw me off my insurance like that never happened before. Mm-hmm. They denied a payment for something I thought that insurance should cover like that's never happened before. Yeah, all well, of that will be familiar problems, although now you'll, I guess, yes. Uh, uh, at now least now it's a I didn't know who to blame before, right. but now I know now it's I a know. Plus, I am definitely opposed to this new provision that insists that I can only visit doctors via chat roulette so there's no chance of my seeing the same one twice. This I did not understand, but it was buried deep within the law. <laughs> yeah, I got right. one meanwhile, second. Meanwhile, right. UPS mm. and uh, Amazon maybe are, are having a little bit of trouble delivering all their uh, uh, Christmas gifts on time. Mm. This despite and- being private companies well that's the thing they're private organizations and they're all about the the dollar and the profit motive and yet they still didn't deliver and that proves something somewhere to somebody i'm not quite sure what hmm maybe it must, there it are... must be the government can't do anything yeah or maybe they need more labor maybe there should be a post office. yes or yeah right or some sort of competitive uh, public Express. option for delivering yeah. I packages. like that Pony Express, uh, Pony Express public option. Yes, exactly. Got to be not? delivered by horse, you know. Oh, and the guy's got to be wearing a cowboy hat, and, you know. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Well, that's good because most of those are made in America. So, just to outfit the Pony Express guys alone would be a stimulus program. Right. So, you know, I I thought that those things were kind of interesting. That and is. Then, uh, the New York Times had a nice uh, article on the front page the other day with health well, good for them. law cemented. GOP debates next move, which is really kind of the point. Huh. People have signed up. Millions of people are signing up. You can't, okay, well, let's just repeal it anymore. You can't do that because now you've got to do something about the two million people that just signed up, who many of whom vote. You know, what are you going to do about them? Yes. They're well, happy. They don't know. They don't know. It, I've heard all these rumblings from conservatives. Oh, well, there's going to be an alternative plan. We'll roll it out after January 1st. Uh, Paul Ryan is working on it, you know bunch of bs they have no plan they've never had a plan and there's not going to be a plan because any concrete thing that they suggest will be attacked by somebody for something because they've set it up that that's the rule right and of course any and anything that ends up as the gop plan will also offer up the opportunity for the ultras to attack it from the right and say it's still socialism and those guys are rhinos and i'm not signing up for this thing either but the exactly. big point Just, about the cementing business, because you have 5.7 million people. If you change it now, 5.7 million people who are presumably, for the most part, happy with what they got, or at least happy that the ordeal is over, to hand them, especially if, can you imagine telling people who who've had to fight so hard to get through to the website and all of that? 5.7 million people, some of whom had trouble and some of whom didn't, being told, you got to do it all over again because us. Yeah, mm. because uh, even though I have my health care, I decided that you shouldn't have yours. Right. I don't think that's going to go over very well. They don't either. So the whole thing is going to collapse in and of itself and its own weight. Uh, and, and it, you know, what's striking is that there's a small contingent, but loud, uh, who have been complaining and, and claiming since October 1st that Obamacare has already failed. 
Mm-hmm. And again, that's one of those other uh, non-factual statements that's going to collapse of its own lack of depth. Uh, you know, as we move forward, and in fact, all these millions of people sign up. It's failed, except for the millions of people who are signing up and getting medical care from it. But except for that, it's already failed. Mm. Yes. So uh, Ryan Cooper, uh, who is a relatively new columnist for the Plum Line, writes with uh, Greg Sargent uh, over at the Washington Post, has a, a nice piece he put up on December 26 called "Hey Dems, the only way out on health care is through." That is to say. Stop trying to be Joe Manchin and say, well, if it collapses, if this happens, if this, if that, if everything else, suck it up. It's your law. It's bound to you. You are bound to it. You can't run from it. Just make it work. Run on offense. Stop playing defense. And there's no reason for you to play defense. Okay? The health site uh, on the web works now well enough. People are signing up by the millions. Embrace it. It's you. I, I'll agree with that. Yeah, I don't know whether we'll convince Joe Manchin of it, but uh, eventually. Eventually. Sure he'll come around as, uh, well, if he gets back to West Virginia, which is what this break is all about, I assume some people will tell him, uh, hey, thanks for the health insurance. But I don't know. So um, there's one more piece I want to bring up completely different, now for something completely different. All right. uh, there's a political columnist for Michigan Live, uh, Susan uh, Dimas who wrote a really nice piece this morning called, I Know Who the Next President Will Be. She does. And she does. (laughs) It's really a great piece. Uh, Let me just read something something from it. So for all of you who really love polls like I do, uh, and maybe even better for those of you who hate polls, you'll love this one. (laughs) She starts out by saying, Chris Christie is going to be president. Mm -hmm. The end. I know this because a recent poll says that the GOP New Jersey governor would beat Hillary Clinton in Iowa if the election were held this month. And let's face it, what's going to change in the more than two years before the Iowa caucuses? I mean, we could be immersed in a new war. Unemployment could rocket up to 14 percent. The Democrats could retake the U.S. House. The point is, if there's one thing we know about politics, it's stagnant. That's why loquacious columns ruminating on the 1884 election as a harbinger for 2014 are super useful. (laughs) <laughs> Not much has changed since post-Reconstruction, and history always determines the future when it comes to elections. And that's why no one needs a confluence of campaign strategy, luck, outside events, election outcomes are preordained. Therefore, polling years out must always be correct, just like Colin Powell leading New Hampshire. Ah, all right. <laughs> well, I can see where, yeah, uh, well, we'll bring Armando in and let him uh, ruminate on that one, too. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I should have said that. This is like, Armando, this one's for you. Let me go tweet this over or uh, uh, send this over to David so he has the link uh, because I think Armando would love this one. All right. Well, I got the link squared away now. So cool. Excellent. That's funny. Yeah. Well, good point and a good reminder. I don't know how we keep forgetting this uh, every week or so but yeah it's true this kind of polling well okay it, it's mostly about should chris christie decide to run or not which he hasn't decided right. yet yes of course not he's too busy blocking bridges apparently this and he could be you know the article points out damaged by that yes you know but that's okay you know it doesn't matter because apparently he's winning yes right and so now he can burn bridges instead of just blocking them so, uh, Absolutely that's right. The, your prerogative when you run for president, you get to switch over to just burning the damn things. Okay, and there's a very important piece that I saw just a flash by on Twitter. I need to bring to your attention. Mm-hmm. Haaretz, the uh, Israeli paper, has just issued a major correction. Oh. Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig are not, in fact, enemies. Oh well, it's important to keep your enemies straight in the Middle East. So good. There. It's 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 extremely important. Mike Damaski uh, points out, how can we trust peace negotiations to people who think Porky Pig is Bugs Bunny's arch enemy? How did that? Uh, well, is it, this isn't a kosher thing, is it? I don't know. I, uh, I hope not. I guess. Uh, yeah, right. it's Porky Pig, and uh, uh, there are right. no Christians. You're absolutely right because because uh, something's not kosher about this whole discussion. I guess not. Well, how did that happen? That uh, well, how did they even? How did Haaretz take notice of this even? I have no idea. I don't know, but here's the the exact correction. It it, it says, an earlier version of this article erroneously stated that Bugs Bunny's most notorious enemy is Porky Pig. Of course, Hmm. they meant that duck. But while the two are known to frequently squabble, often in the public eye, they are, in fact, good friends. Well, that's that's good news. It's good to know. Well, hmm. I, I don't know how that came about. But now Porky Pig... It is, he's an interesting third wheel in all this. He, he is, of course, uh, well, if not enemies, rivals, certainly, with 
Daffy Duck, and you never can tell whether it's rabbit season or duck season. But I am seeing a lot of hog, feral hog hunting accidents too. I don't think Porky should have been left out of this debate. And uh, we'll see once they're all being hunted whether they all remain friends or not. We'll see. It's like one of those reality game shows. Who's yep. going to get off the island? Who's going to be hunted first? Right. So uh, all of no, that's important. Uh, uh, or it's not, you know, <laughs> depending upon whether or not it starts uh, World War Four. So uh, a nice piece uh, to wrap up with at the end. Well, that's uh, all. Just to leave you with something to think about. Uh, that's all, folks, right? Maybe I should stop there. Uh, Don Gagne over at NPR has a piece called Amid Declining Popularity, the Tea Party Prepares to Fight, all about the uh, on- ongoing and still happening Republican uh, Civil War, which is always uh, entertaining uh, to-, to read. Uh, and uh, it's happening because uh, uh, Karl Rove and American Crossroads are gearing up to play defense for some of the Republican establishment folks as they uh, uh, potentially face face, uh, primaries. But at the same time, there's a whole bunch of uh, outside funded, you might say, outside since it's not part of the Republican establishment, uh, outside funded PACs and other things which are ready to throw just as much money into these races. It doesn't mean that the insurgents will win, but uh, the Tea Party genie has not yet been stuffed back into the bottle and it's always worth a good reminder. So with that, I will uh, take it uh, to the end for today. This is uh, Greg Dwork, and I'm speaking with David Waldman. Uh, here we are on uh, Kegro in the morning, and in fact, we're in a lot of different places. We act radio, and you could find us on Stitcher. You could find uh, uh, Netroots Radio at various and sundry places, including their own website. We're here on podcast, and maybe that's how you're listening to us with a download later. Or maybe you're listening to us live. But however you are, thanks so much for doing all of that. It's the end of the week. And uh, I take it we'll be back on Monday? Uh, yes, uh, we will. And we're going to try and do uh, I always have to check, schedule. for sure. Yeah, holiday me too. Schedule, but... I know, right? Because we're so professional. We just sort of wing these things with a little email in between. Uh, to make sure that we're on the same schedule. But I think, yeah, we'll give my kids a little time next week, do a Monday and Friday uh, kickoff and recap and, and handle it that way. And uh, that sounds great. So okay. uh, I'll see you then and, yes. and enjoy the rest of the show. I'll listen to it later on podcast myself and uh, right. find out what you said about me after I got off the air. Take <laughs> okay. care. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks for checking in. We'll see you after the weekend for kicking off next week. So that is interesting. I want to see if I can find out without interrupting too much how the how this cartoon debate actually happened and how Haaretz came to be interested in this at all. And uh, it was I was interested in the uh, follow up too. Karl Rove, by the way, another of Bugs Bunny's most notorious enemies. And I think probably somehow I would guess you would if you had to pick. I think he's aligned with Porky Pig in this. Is he a Daffy Duck guy? Because Daffy Duck was very into the money thing, too. Porky Pig, sort of a, an independent uh, third way here. We didn't. It, there was nothing interesting about it. They were, you know, it was very cute that Porky Pig thought he had a place in all this debate, but uh, really all the action was as between the ducks and the, the rabbits, both of whom were being hunted by an inept gun owner uh, by the name of Elmer Fudd, who uh, it was very... Interesting interplay in all this. But if anybody knows how Haaretz, of all places, became interested in this, were they trying to draw some sort of analogy or tell us something that we didn't know about American politics somehow? Or is Hezbollah like one of the characters? And is that it? Are they drawing a parallel to Middle Eastern? I cannot figure this out. I don't know. Meanwhile, I also see that uh, what what in the hell is this? Somebody is uh, sending around Slade Somer from uh, Hypervocal tweeting around a gif of Anderson Cooper uh, eating a what the Chiron on the screen says is a supersized candy snake. Like is it a gigantic gummy snake or something? It looks to be something like six feet long. But there's another guy on set eating the other side and then. <laughs> <laughs> there goes Anderson eating. And wow, there's so much packed into that GIF. And we'll just let that stand because, uh, you know, things that work on multiple levels, I can't always explain necessarily on the radio. So, uh, yeah, well, following up on some of the stories that Greg had pointed us to, let's see, I've got the um, 
the uh, Susan uh, Demas or Demas. How did we decide to say her name? Uh, article up here. I know who will be the next, uh, or I know who the next president will be. We'll have to debate that one a little bit further, maybe if Armando wants to join in. But I have a feeling he'll accept the premise of this. Uh, that and also Craig's mention about the numbers being generated uh, over uh, at Brain Wraps, um, his site and spreadsheet, <clears throat> and it's the idea of the millions of people signing up for Affordable Care Act insurance or through the Affordable Care Act exchanges for insurance being somehow denied or discounted in some way. It is very interesting that uh, there's this big demand for accurate numbers of who has signed up. And, and that's just because we want to know what the re state of reality is. How many people have done it? And it's interesting that the conservatives are, for instance, at the same time saying, we must have exact numbers about people who have signed up for Affordable Health Care Act insurance, but you are not allowed, for instance, to collect accurate numbers about people who have owned sort of, uh, who have, have gone out and procured the anti-health insurance of guns. Of course, they would insist that those are, in fact, health insurance. They keep your family healthy and protected and alive. The data, I think, is somewhat... Uh, it runs counter to that in some ways. But that data, we're not allowed to have. You can't count those things, but you got to count the other things. And if you do, if you're prying, why isn't that a gigantic uh, invasion of people's privacy to insist on exact numbers? Why can't we just muddy this whole thing and say it's a violation of people's freedom and liberty to count accurately how many of them have signed up for health insurance and if you don't think so, you must hate the Second Amendment or something like that. Or maybe you hate the First Amendment. There's some kind of amendment you hate. We know that. And uh, you're not allowed to have the information. Somehow that would not fly. But somewhere along the line, Second Amendment, yada, yada, whatever. I'm not really sure how that happened. But, uh, you know, the, the fact that it's nonsense is uh, not news. <clears throat> so... Uh, yes, as I was uh, talking about also when Greg first joined us, lots of uh, tweeting of Christmas Day pictures of people unwrapping and holding and posing with their brand new guns. Uh, most, uh, most often in the pictures with new AR-15s. That was the very, very hot Christmas gift this year. And I was a little bit surprised by that uh, n for a number of reasons. One, of course, following uh, well, around this time last year, the AR-15 was apparently next to impossible to get because there was a run on them, perversely enough, because, of course, they had just been used in yet another mass shooting. And uh, it is, by the way, the gun of choice for crazed mass shooting. That's still uh, still true. And was true even before Newtown and Sandy Hook. But uh, that sort of put the exclamation point on the whole thing. Everybody sort of began to realize, hey, these things turn up at all of these mass shootings. Yes, though, uh, it is also worth pointing out that the vast majority of shootings, period, uh, happen with handguns and not long guns. It was just one of those weird things that the most spectacular shootings going on kept having AR-15s turning up. And then, of course, everyone got so worried that they were going to be banned. And why would they become so worried that they were going to be banned? It was because they kept showing up at mass shootings and someone might say, hey, we should do something about this. Uh, so everyone ran out to try and grab them and they were disappearing from the shelves. Although, as it turns out later on, uh, there are a number of uh, people who are, who are uh, gun shop owners and employees who are being arrested for having stolen a bunch of them. But there was a run on these things and they were expensive and difficult to get. This year for Christmas, everybody who wanted one got one, I guess, because they stepped up production like crazy and lots of new entrants into the market. Uh, so plenty of AR-15s to go around, and apparently all the people who wanted them for Christmas got them. I also thought they were an inappropriate choice for Christmas gift, not just because giving somebody an automated killing machine for Christmas might be counter to the spirit, but of course these guys view these things as peacemakers. 
Um, I also just thought it was inappropriate from the price tag perspective. How much does an AR-15 cost? Uh, my recollection was that uh, at the time that they were, uh, last year anyway, that they were up uh, in the neighborhood of $1,000. And some of them, depending on how much, how tricked out you wanted the thing, you might end up, uh, you know, spending quite a bit about it. And I think, uh, by the way, la if you bought it last year, you paid a premium, the panic premium. And so this year, maybe a little bit less. But here, uh, for instance, okay, I, I'm just Googling around. AtlanticFirearms.com. That might not be the best price there is. And, I, and by the way, some of these might end up having video pop up. I have no idea. But Atla I just Googled the cost of uh, an AR-15. Atlantic Firearms came up pretty high up, and they, they've got an awful lot of great things available here. Let's see. There's the, the BR-99 AR-15-style shotgun. They also say they specialize in AK-47s. The inventor of the AK-47, uh, Kalishnikov himself, just died recently. Not He wasn't shot or anything. He just got old. <laughs> this guy managed to protect himself with his AK-47 to the ripe old age of 94 or so. Um... But also advertised on the front page here, there were uh, Uzis that were for sale, all tricked out with some awesome-looking attachments. Yeah, there we are. Vector arms and CIA arms. Oh, CAI arms. Uzi rifles and pistols, six ninety-nine and up. That not six dollars and ninety-nine cents, but six hundred and ninety-nine dollars. And the Uzi, this one has a nice long barrel attached to it, and uh, a gigantic magazine coming out the bottom, and a little shoulder, a little butt and shoulder rest uh so uh that's interesting too and of course all for sale with sliding stocks slide fire stocks as they call them or sometimes bump stocks these are little attachments by the way that allow you to approximate fully automatic fire with your semi-automatic rifle uh, so as you know, uh, lots of gun enthusiasts will say, no, 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 no. The people who refer to these as automatic weapons or machine guns, that's wrong. Uh, they're illegal or, or not illegal, but uh, it, it's a very different thing to get one of those. It requires a totally different license. You can't just run around selling those things the same way you can semi-automatics. But yeah, uh, in, in case you had any doubt about that, you can find legal uh, snap-on attachments, basically, that you can, for very little money, turn your semi-automatic rifle into one that fires just like a fully automatic rifle and uh, no real uh, issues about doing that and apparently nothing illegal about it either. And it's one of the more popular, uh, well, I guess, gifts that you can give either to yourself or others. Interesting also for sale here on front page of Atlantic Firearms, because everyone's so patriotic, is the Russian Vapor Rifle, V-E-P-R. And it's very nice looking if you are into awesome type guns. But it's interesting that they sell it, the little uh, marketing goo that they have attached to the picture is a Soviet hammer and sickle. So very interesting that an awesome patriot like you would be interested in buying a gun that had the hammer and sickle attached to it. But I think that just comes from the awesomeness of otherness and having an enemy and saying, I have his gun. Let's see. There's uh, What else is for sale on the front page here? M10 AK-47, uh, body armor, as low as $240. So that's good. Uh, they also have a 45-day layaway plan, if you are interested in that. Uh, but I think what grabbed my eye was that they had these guns available. So some of the things that people were giving away as Christmas gifts are, in fact, $1,000 guns. Here we have an AK-47 for uh, $1,099. We've got uh, a 9mm Atlantic Arms pistol that, uh, of course, the pistol is gigantic and has a huge clip. Got the AR-15 100-round drum, so you can carry 100 rounds with you. Uh, in, instead of uh, limiting yourself to a magazine of 30, why not have 100 rounds? 125 bucks for one of those. Um, 
Let's see. So you can get some of these assault rifle style things for considerably less, but it looks like you can outfit some of these things as kits for mm, six hundred dollars. Uh, whereas uh, I guess for the full on uh, AR fifteens that people were posing with, yeah, you're still talking about eight hundred to a thousand dollars, which that's I guess really the interesting part. To me, I if you can get past the idea of gun as Christmas gift, you know, and these people can theoretically do that pretty simply. They live in a different mindset. That's fine. The $1,000 price tag for somebody's Christmas gift doesn't make any sense to me. Now, this is something I think is a cultural difference here too, right? Like running into having hooks around the door and you say, what are these for? Oh, they're for Christmas lights. Oh, yes. Well, I don't put any of those up, so it wouldn't occur to me. Uh, putting a bow on top of a brand new car, for instance. Does it happen? Do people do this? In the uh, Jewish Hanukkah gift-giving tradition, typically no. I mean, not that there aren't people who do do that. Well, I know. But uh, the Hanukkah gift, traditionally, never really a huge thing like that. It's kind of turned into it, I guess, because a copycat sort of thing about Christmas, but uh, I've never done it. My family's never done it. The idea of being handed a $1,000 anything was pretty much out of the question. The idea of that $1,000 thing being a gigantic semi-automatic assault rifle, that wasn't going to happen in my family either, even if you paid for it, even if you put your own money towards it. But uh, I think the lowest price one I see here, let's see, I see a, an American Tactical Omni uh, Poly M4 Carbine, four ninety nine on sale, although who knows what it was that price uh, pre-Christmas. But yeah, the AR-15s are looking to be like $1,000 in that neighborhood for the low end, and they go up from there. And if you get a really tricked out one, then you're really talking about something serious, maybe as much as $2,000. And uh, so they were handing them out like candy over the Christmas holiday, and the number of people posing with them was disturbing, and the number of people posing with them with their fingers on the trigger more disturbing still. So I distributed, I think I found uh, pretty quickly, five or six people posing with their fingers on the trigger. And uh, Brandon Friedman, by the way, did a great job retweeting those things and scolding people. He has a, uh, a military guy and uh, a gun user anyway himself uh, able to speak with some authority to them about that and say, hey, you know, get your finger off the trigger. You can't be doing that. And uh, I was, I'll say this, I was gratified to see that many gun enthusiasts, you know, absolutely, no doubt about it, 100% Second Amendment loving gun enthusiasts who would argue with me or anybody else over just about anything about guns any other day of the year, rather enthusiastically retweeting those admonitions, hey, stop tweeting pictures of yourself with your fingers on the trigger, uh, at the very least, because it makes other gun owners look bad. So, I don't know. I thought that was interesting because we found sort of a back door into a way of finding some agreement with the people that we're usually arguing with. And, uh, you know, that might not be where you want to end up. There are a lot of people who say, eh, you know, I'd rather go back to arguing with them because fundamentally I think that they shouldn't be allowed to have the things, period. But I did find it gratifying that there was at least a safety message that we could agree on. If you didn't get in their face about the right to own them at all, and that's not where many of you would want to stop. Many of you would want to continue on to that. I still haven't really decided where I come down on that stuff. All I want, as for starters, is don't kill your neighbors by accident for uh, having gotten yourself one of these new things we already had that and i am anticipating a gun fail uh installment coming up full of accidental shootings with christmas guns we had it last year and you're gonna have it again this year i mean that's just reality that's what historical trends tell us 
thanks data and not anecdotes for that. The data tells me I'm going to have more anecdotes this year. I think I've got all the usage properly done there. Uh, but we did already have our accident. I don't know whether it was a brand new, I don't think it was a brand new gun in this one, but our first Christmas Day accidental shooting that I found came to us from Florida, of course, because Florida. And uh, let me see if I can grab that. Uh, I set things aside. That will be in Gun Fail 50, by the way. So a Roman numerals situation, we're up to just L. So that'll be interesting. So, so next installation will be Gun Fail Lil. Uh, and that'll just be interesting all by itself. Uh, and here are the highlights of what's coming for Gun Fail 50, which I might try and publish uh, on the early side of this weekend, after all, since we're already up to 33 incidents, uh, not counting what I've found today. But the one I grabbed from Christmas morning was from what town in Florida? Deltona, Florida. Not Daytona, Deltona. Too many Tonas. That's the problem with Florida. In Deltona, a man was killed on Wednesday morning. That was Christmas, Wednesday morning. He was shot to death. He was hit in the chest in his own backyard. Right, so what about your freedom and liberty and yada yada? The guy owns his own property. He's out in his own damn backyard, probably in his bathrobe, although it might not even have been in that cold. Who knows? Maybe he's just in shorts. Maybe he was in something offensive or naked, and that's why he was shot. I don't know. But this is in Volusia County, uh, Florida. Volusia, of course, uh, made famous in the 2000 recount, one of the counties with the uh, biggest problems, I think, in their in their recounting, among not including uh, West Palm Beach or Palm Beach County. At any rate, uh, this man was out in his backyard, shot in the chest, 69 years old, shot and killed. Uh, and in case you're looking for a house in Volusia County or Deltona, uh, Cade Hill Drive, in the 3200 block of Cade Hill Drive. On the one hand, I know about an opening. <laughs> so... Uh, if you're interested in moving into the neighborhood, uh, low, low price, price slashed on the value of this home. You'll be able to pick this one up super cheap because the neighbors are a bit of a problem. But if you're not worried about that, 3200 block of Cade Hill Drive is the place to be. Uh, how did he get killed? Well, initial reports, stray bullet. Okay. How did there come to be a stray bullet there? There could be any number of reasons, but I police suspect the sheriff's office in Volusia County suspects that the problem really lies with a neighbor who recently built a shooting range on his property because you're allowed to do whatever the hell you want on your property in Florida. And he figured, well, he, he built a raised berm behind his shooting range, and I guess he didn't raise it enough. Or maybe he did, but they just had a wacky freak accident, as sometimes happens, it's very often when you have these raised berms, especially if you're a big enthusiast and you want to shoot your long rifles there, very often people like to pretend they're military and they get down on the ground and they shoot these things and the bullets skip off the ground and zing, fly over the raised berm. And when you build them, you figure, well, if it flies over the raised berm, then it's on an upward trajectory. So it's not going to hit anybody. It's just going to fly off into the stratosphere and not bother anybody. Or something, or it's going to gently parachute down to earth and lay on a pillow where it won't hurt anybody. Uh, not so in the case uh, there in the 3200 block of Cade Hill Drive of Deltona, Florida, where a 69 year old man was instead shot to death in his own backyard because freedom for somebody else. So we'll see how that one turns out. In the meantime, we also had plenty of other more routine accidental shootings. Four year old who shot himself in the hand Christmas morning in Williamson County, Tennessee, Franklin, Tennessee, to be specific. Uh, probably not life-threatening because he shot himself in the hand, but uh, that's going to hurt. And I don't know whether that was a new gun that was left laying around or not. And none of these specifically say brand new gun. Last year we got a couple of those, but only a week or two after Christmas. Uh, what comes to mind is, uh, let's see, one 12-year-old who shot his 12-year-old cousin to death when he came over to see what Christmas presents he had gotten, and he said, look what I got. It was a 20-gauge shotgun. 
And uh, then they decided to jump on the new trampoline with the 20 gauge shotgun and somebody got shot and killed. And that was the end of that. So uh, lots of activity going on in the background. Can I, can we help you with something, sir? No? Okay. You're just going to drag that chair across the floor instead of pick it up because it weighs two pounds. You could do that. All right. That's a way of handling things too. Uh, let's see a few other Christmas Day incidents. Oh, here's a 12-year-old. See, the 12-year-olds love the, the guns on Christmas. Uh, one accidentally shot in the lower leg. Oh, yes, I remember this one. On East Jacobs Road, north of Spokane Valley, Spokane, Washington. If you're a 12-year-old on East Jacobs Road, you'll want to watch out for this too. Boy and his grandfather roughhousing together, as will often happen on a Christmas and ought to, and everyone ought to enjoy it. Uh, thing is, Grandpa, if he's got a gun and a holster on his belt, is going to want to remove that before roughhousing. That not the case in Spokane, Washington, and 12-year-old grandson took one in the leg as a result. But boy, does Grandpa feel bad about that one. So that'll help heal things up just fine. Uh, down in Dallas, Texas, we've had a few of those too. Let's see, one gentleman has been charged with two counts of deadly contact. I didn't even realize that was a crime down in Dallas, but I guess it is. After he discharged a gun inside his apartment, he shot through two neighboring apartments with that one. So uh, if you're thinking about sharing your gifts with neighbors and letting them know that you got a new gun for Christmas, uh, a, a letter, a note, an email, an Instagram will be fine. No reason to shoot through their apartment to let them know. Uh, they would appreciate just a written note. Uh, and really, the art of writing those sorts of thank you notes uh, has been lost. So there's really uh, no need to resort to the instantaneous communications methods, especially if you mean shooting through their apartment. A few other of these happened. Uh, let's see. We got some Christmas Day ones. We got some immediate post-Christmas on Boxing Day shootings. Lake Charles, Louisiana, 20-year-old gentleman shot himself uh, accidentally in the head and ended his Christmas season early. Uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, someone took one in the leg. Again, same thing, cleaning his gun. Uh, I don't know if that was a new one, but it, by the way, that's another thing. If they're brand new, you don't need to clean it just yet. A lot of pictures being tweeted around of people taking them out to shoot them right away, though. I mean, I can understand that. You open your new toy and you <clears throat> and you want to use it right away. And, and surprising and somewhat alarming number of people referring to them as toys. And I know that's just shorthand and you can't really fault them for it. But gosh, you wish they would just think of their new guns as something slightly different from toys. It pays to have a different mindset, <clears throat> I think, when you're handling a gun like that. Uh, let's see, some other ones, uh, let's see, a 14-year-old in Nashville, Tennessee, taken to the hospital, shot himself in the foot, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, we had two people wounded when a gun accidentally discharged yesterday, uh, there's a Dallas, uh, story this morning of a 14-year-old shot in the face by a 24-year-old who was sure that the gun was unloaded. That's another category I'm gonna have to end up, uh, add up at the end of the year with my gun fail. Roundup. That was, by the way, the, the, the chief response that I got from gun enthusiasts who weren't in agreement that you shouldn't take pictures with your finger on the trigger, and there were a few. Their chief uh, response was, well, some of these guns, you can see the magazine is out. And I'm a little alarmed by that response, too. Now, Truth be told, it is very likely that those guns, those pictures are taken of guns that are just out of the box. And so even I would have to admit that the chance that they're somehow loaded, that there's a round in the chamber despite the magazine being out, is pretty low. But like most gun enthusiasts themselves say, it pays to have good, safe practice at all times. Because why not? Why not be safe whenever you can? So don't put your finger on the trigger. Don't put your finger inside the trigger guard. And, and you know... The gun enthusiasts who like to take pictures of, with, of themselves with their guns are very conscious of these things and very, it's, you know, a sign of coolness in a way to be holding their gun and to purposefully have their index and middle fingers sometimes too straight and on display, obviously outside of the 
trigger guard. That's sort of a sign of, you know, I'm actually trained and cool, so watch out for me. Now, why you would not why why would you want to pass on the opportunity to do that? Probably because you've never really heard what the safety rules are, including the first one, which is treat every gun as if it's loaded, even if it just came out of the box. And in case you're looking for anecdotes on that, I have a number of stories, particularly of accidents that took place at gun shows where people could, you know, I swear I just saw the dealer take this out of the box and put it on the table for me. And now uh, I have accidentally shot myself. So it must be anti-gun nut sabotage that did it, as opposed to this gun dealer is kind of a dope. And also, on top of which, he's trying to fool me by pretending that this thing came out of the box for the first time just now. And yet it was loaded. Gee whiz, I wonder if he was trying to rip me off to begin with. But even right out of the box, guns can still be loaded. And even if they, even if you know somehow for a fact that they're not, there really is no good reason for pretending it couldn't possibly be loaded. Because once again, my list of... It's definitely wasn't loaded a minute ago stories is pretty long and getting longer every day. I'm sure it'll get longer today. And uh, as the weekend rolls up and people actually get a chance to go out and play around with their new toys, they even that much more. Uh, I'm sure the numbers will just be headed north from there. All right. Let's see what other interesting stories I collected over the weekend and see whether we can cram some of those into the second hour of today's show. Uh, yes, I, I know there were a couple of good ones here. Mm. Some of which are immediately irrelevant news, and some of which are longer-term stories, and some of which have nothing to do with anything. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, and, and this one comes, I saw this morning. Kenzo Shibata, who is a Chicago teacher activist and writer, oh, and digital media strategist. And and it's a name I recognize, and I can't even be sure why I recognize Kenzo Shibata's name. Maybe it's just so such an interesting and uh, memorable name. Have I seen him on Twitter? Do I follow? I don't even know anymore. Anyway, he has this interesting one. You remember we heard this term not long ago, affluenza. Uh, and here, an interesting take on things. Why the left must embrace affluenza? Well, you, you feel like there might be some satirical content to this. But take a look at this one. Uh, Kenzo Shibata writes, I can't remember in my lifetime any diseases cured or new vaccines developed. I can't imagine how elated the world must have been when Jonas Salk released the polio vaccine, making the pernicious disease virtually non-existent in America. Salk was revered not only for his innovation, but for his insistence on releasing the vaccine to the world without a patent. Ah, yes. His work being only to serve humanity. You would never find that again uh, these days. The left has an opportunity right now. There is a crisis that using neoliberal policy strategy, we should not, quote, let go to waste. The crisis is affluenza, the disease that claimed the lives of four innocent people in Texas and can be traced back to the deaths of vast swaths of the population through austerity measures and poverty wages. Hmm, so true. Affluenza was first coined, by the way, in a 1997 PBS documentary of the same name. I did not know that. The term became famous this month when 16-year-old Jesse Couch had his sentence for drunk driving and killing four people, injuring two others, mitigated from 20 years in prison to 10 years of probation. The judge ruled that Couch was not responsible for his acts because of his parents' immense wealth and the fact that it had cushioned him from understanding that his actions had consequences. He called this affliction of extreme privilege affluenza. Isn't that interesting that uh, somehow when you become extremely wealthy, you go from believing you can control everything to believing that you really have no control over anything and I don't understand that my actions have consequences. It, It is amazing that the privilege that money gives you at the same time, uh, with the same money and the same person, can think they ha- can have whatever they want because of the actions they're able to take as a result of having immense wealth. But then if somebody says, hey, 
some of the things you did are actually uh, crimes or create criminal liability or even civil liability with you. Oh, all of a sudden, oh, I, I had no idea I could control things. I had no idea. Hmm. Oh, uh, let me interrupt this for this news bulletin from uh, the, uh, I guess, from the Detroit pra- papers, the free, pe- free Press, which they refer to as Freep, which is not the same thing as Free Republic Freep. Uh, but Der Commissar tweets to us, uh, this is the Josh Denk, in case you wanted to find out who the Der Commissar was. He, he's the Josh Denk. So thanks, Josh, for this one. Man shoots self in buttocks at Home Depot with gun he was carrying. Well, that's good. At least it was a gun he was carrying. If it was the guy behind him and shot him in the buttocks, wow, what an exciting Home Depot that would be. Well, he shot himself. Let's just open that one up for later uh, viewing. Ah, very interesting. So, uh, yes, the shooting yourself with your own concealed weapon at a store continues. That's one of the hottest trends going right now. Uh, Even though the shopping season, I guess, is over, now I guess all the return season is on, or people are going to spend their gift cards. So watch out while you're shopping. People uh, now have lots of guns that they got for Christmas, and they're not quite used to them yet, and they're in their pockets, and people are going to be shifting them around or dropping them accidentally Dangerous time to be out. you got to duck your whole life out there. Anyway, back to the affluenza story from Kenzo Shibata. Uh, Yeah, you remember that case from down in Texas. He continues and says, This caused outrage in many folks who thought that the teen needed prison time to pay for his actions and possibly rehabilitate him from his disease. However, the criminal justice system has a lousy record in terms of curtailing recidivism and frankly does not address the root cause of this disease, which is massive accumulation of wealth. Hey, good points. If being super rich and living a life free of consequences causes violent acts, we must argue that grotesque wealth is a public health concern. Aha! Now we're getting somewhere. The only real remedy for this problem, which affects only 1% of the population, is to remove the infected mass from those afflicted by means of wealth redistribution. And it's just medically necessary, folks. You know, some of you people don't agree with liberalizing marijuana policy, but you understand the medicinal value of it and you're willing to make some exceptions. This is purely for medical reasons. Wealth redistribution for medical necessity. If there were a disease that afflicts 1% of the population, but 99% of the population will suffer its consequences, I cannot think of a better term than crisis, says Shibata. We don't need doctors or medical researchers to fix this crisis. We need tax experts who can design the procedures for wealth ectomies on 1% of the population. This will not be easy, but this is a crisis that must be remedied before one more 16-year-old rich kid takes the lives of innocent families. I fear that the bankers who tanked the economy five years ago and sailed off in golden parachutes have an even more extreme strain of affluenza, and those are the folks we need to send to triage immediately. Some folks argued that they should be jailed for their actions, but jail does not address the systemic problems that are caused by affluenza, as the Couch's judge concurred. Tax them to the point where gaming the system no longer yields rewards, and we will soon see no more signs of affluenza in their bloodstreams. We must end the existence of the 1% in order to save them. Yes, interesting application of a number of Uh, enduring doctrines, whether they're right or wrong. uh, Who am I to say? All I can tell you is I'm for traditional American values, and a lot of those answers are traditionally given by people who say they're traditionally in in favor of traditional American values. So long as they're, but I guess it's usually because they're being exercised on you and your face instead of all the rest of them. Hmm. All right. What else have we got here? Uh, Oh, yes. You know what? Uh, I wanted to take a look at this one. Here is, because this is Daily Coast Radio, it pays to take a look sometimes at what's going on in Daily Coast. And I always like when I send myself a little uh, attachment from from Daily Coast. This is a diary by D'Artagnan, who writes, Why no Wall Street CEOs? Oh, hey, the, there's a pop-up in my way, and I can't read it. Who am I to blame for this? <laughs> Daily Coast. Thanks a lot. Uh, Why no Wall Street CEOs were prosecuted for causing the financial crisis? I always did wonder about that. Well, D'Artagnan says he knows. 
And the piece begins this way, where they quote, if you prosecute a CEO or other senior executive and send him or her to jail for committing a crime, the deterrent effect, in my view, vastly outweighs even the best compliance program you can put in place. All right. Well, apparently that was a federal judge speaking because the piece then continues. It's unusual for a federal judge to weigh in on specific matters that could conceivably come before his bench. There's a lot of capitalizing going on in this uh, that I think is unnecessary. But all right. It's even more unusual when those matters involve politically sensitive issues of national policy. A hard-hitting essay published recently in the New York Review of Books by a 70-year-old active United States District Judge has raised eyebrows for doing just that. Judge Jed S. Rakoff, sits for the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, the nerve center of the financial world. A Clinton appointee and former federal prosecutor, he stunned the SEC in 2011 by rejecting a proposed $285 million settlement between the U.S. and Citigroup in a case where Citigroup had been accused of misleading investors through the sale and packaging of collateralized debt obligations. Rakoff's rationale for rejecting the settlement, which he characterized as pocket change, me too, I would, was that Citigroup was not required to admit culpability. The SEC changed its position on this practice after this ruling. Good. Today, Rakoff is once again getting under the government's skin. He wonders aloud why no high-level corporate CEOs or other managing officers in private finance and banking firms have been prosecuted for causing the financial meltdown that led to what we now know as the Great Recession. His essay, linked above, suggests several reasons and leads to at least one unsettling conclusion, that the Justice Department believes governmental officials' actions tacitly, if not directly, abetted and enabled the crisis to the point where prosecuting corporate CEOs would simply end up implicating the U.S. government. Hmm. That would be interesting. And it would be rather frustrating to uh, directly implicate them and then not be able to prosecute them. But there, you know, there is actual doctrine for that. Uh, whether sovereign immunity or anything else, uh, uh, you know, it seems like it's not right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you should stop short of prosecuting private actors who are, in fact, liable, just because there would also be equally culpable public actors who might not be. There, you know, well, there's a number of lines we can draw between the private sector and the public sector, and that's one of them. And everybody seems to think that the private sector is super duper awesome. But, you know, part of what keeps the private sector honest and therefore super duper awesome is the ability of the public sector to prosecute them when they do things wrong. Now, you could argue that there ought to be more uh, more uh, accountability for the public sector. And that's fine, too. But, uh, OK, fine. You're just going to have to lobby for that and get that law passed, but I don't see anybody moving on it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Rakoff, to return to his work, uh, and uh, here as described by D'Artagnan in this post, uh, Rakoff, his essay, opens with some basic questions. It says, who was to blame? Was it simply a result of negligence, of the kind of inordinate risk-taking commonly called a bubble, of an imprudent but innocent failure to maintain adequate reserves for a rainy day, or was it the result, at least in part, of fraudulent practices, of dubious mortgages portrayed as sound risks and packaged into ever more esoteric financial instruments, the fundamental weaknesses of which were intentionally obscured? Rakoff acknowledges that if the financial crisis were the product of mere negligence, then prosecution of corporate executives would simply be scapegoating of the worst kind. But if the evidence points to intentional fraud, that is exactly the type of conduct the Justice Department is designed to confront, and its failure to do so a travesty of justice in its own right. Rakoff continues, But if, by contrast, the Great Recession was in material part the product of intentional fraud, the failure to prosecute those responsible must be judged one of the more egregious failures of the criminal justice system in many years. Indeed, it would stand in striking contrast to the increased success that federal prosecutors have had over the past 50 years or so in bringing justice to even the highest level figures who orchestrated mammoth frauds. D'Artagnan continues, constrained by his ethical obligation to maintain judicial propriety, 
Rakoff takes great pains to emphasize he has no knowledge that fraud was in fact committed. What he does is distill the crisis to its basic elements, that subprime mortgages of questionable creditworthiness were being packaged and sold as collateral for highly leveraged securities, nonetheless rated as AAA low risk. How this circumstance could arise without at all, uh, without someone, well, lying along the way, would appear to be a rhetorical question, which Rakoff raises, but lets the reader follow through to its conclusion. Instead of expressing an opinion, Rakoff allows the record to speak for itself. <clears throat> and here it goes. The stated opinion of those government entities asked to examine the financial crisis overall is not that no fraud was committed. Quite the contrary. For example, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, in its final report, uses variants of the word fraud no fewer than 157 times in describing what led to the crisis, including that there was a, quote, systemic breakdown, not just in accountability, but also in ethical behavior. As the commission found, the signs of fraud were everywhere to be seen. Rakoff then systematically dissects the Justice Department's three predominant excuses for their failure to prosecute individuals who undoubtedly fostered the conditions that led to the financial meltdown of 2008. The first, the difficulty of proving intent, an essential element to prove fraud, he finds weak. Judge Rakoff believes that given the scale of the abuse, the Justice Department would be capable of eliciting enough evidence to prove conscious disregard or willful blindness on the part of corporate CEOs and officers whose companies engaged in these transactions. In a federal criminal trial for fraud, conscious disregard can and does qualify as intent. The second excuse, the proof of reliance would be difficult since the parties to these transactions were sophisticated investors, he dismisses fairly out of hand. The criminal standard for fraud requires no such proof, and he explains why. Finally, the Justice Department, specifically Attorney General Eric Holder, has raised the possibility that such prosecutions might result in economic harm to the country. Rakoff believes that for a federal official charged with enforcing the law, this position, the too-big-to-jail position, is disturbing, to say the least. He notes that Holder recalibrated his remarks and said that they have been misconstrued, but in any event, this leads Rakoff to a central point, that this concern evaporates if individuals are targeted rather than institutions. Rakoff believes that the high-profile prosecution of individual CEOs would have a far greater deterrent effect than do the prosecutions of the companies they work for. So if justice's excuses are hollow, what is the real reason these prosecutions haven't occurred? Rakoff tacks off the familiar justifications. First, because agents who could have worked the cases were transferred to anti-terrorism duty after 9-11, Second, that the SEC operates under a very limited budget, limited even more by congressional Republicans. And finally, that the potential cases were parceled out to assistant U.S. attorneys with a greater personal interest in prosecuting run-of-the-mill financial fraud, such as insider trading, because of their immediate payoff. None of these explanations is particularly satisfactory to him, given the scope of the harm done. This brings him to his second, more alarming point, that the government's own role in fostering the events that led to the crisis has had a chilling effect on prosecutors. And here another quote from Rakoff. Even before the start of the housing boom, it was the government in the form of Congress that repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, thus allowing certain banks that had previously viewed mortgages as a source of interest income to, be, uh, to become instead deeply involved in securitizing pools of mortgage mortgages in order to obtain the much greater benefits available from trading. It was the government in the form of both the executive and the legislature that encouraged deregulation, thus weakening the power and oversight not only of the SEC, but also such diverse banking overseers as the Office of Thrift Supervision and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, both in the Treasury Department. It was the government in the form of the Federal Reserve. Hmm more or less, that kept interest rates low in part to encourage mortgages. If you read that paragraph carefully, you'll notice that, fair or not, no one escapes blame 
From the start to the finish, the U.S. government has had its hands in the financial mess, and it was again the U.S. government, recall, for example, the near unanimity between the outgoing Bush and incoming Obama administrations on TARP, who readily forgave and immediately bailed out most of the very entities directly responsible for the disaster in the first place. Rakoff continues, What I am suggesting is that the government was deeply involved from beginning to end in helping create the conditions that could lead to such fraud, and that this would give a prudent prosecutor pause in deciding whether to indict a CEO who might, with some justice, claim that he was only doing what he fairly believed the government wanted him to do. Yeah, I don't know how well that'll fly, but okay, it's an interesting setup. And that, my friends, is a good, as good a reason as any why you have seen no prosecutions of high-level private financial firms, CEOs, in connection with their actions leading up to the meltdown. While Rakoff won't come out and say it, the implication is clear. If the elements are there to establish fraud and then the prosecutor's job is to prosecute. But who to prosecute when the CEO starts attributing his actions to the government? And implicating the government always means naming names, from Rubin to Graham to Clinton to Reagan and everyone in between. Finally, Rakoff criticizes the trend by the Justice Department toward punishing companies as opposed to the folks who run them, a trend he describes as unfortunate, leading to a familiar dance that looks like this. Early in the investigation, You invite in counsel to the company and explain to him or her why you suspect fraud. He or she responds by assuring you that the company wants to cooperate and do the right thing. And to that end, the company has hired a former assistant U.S. attorney, now a partner at a respected law firm, to do an internal investigation. Six months later, the company's counsel returns with a detailed report showing that mistakes were made, but that the company is now intent on correcting them. You and the company then agree that the company will enter into a deferred prosecution agreement requiring fines and future compliance requirements. You are happy because you believe that you have helped prevent future crimes. The company is happy because it has avoided a devastating indictment. And perhaps the happiest of all are the executives or former executives who actually committed the underlying misconduct, for they are left untouched. True enough. The fact that this is coming from a judge who has a history of creating heartburn for the Justice Department simply bolsters its credibility. In the meantime, the consequences of the financial crisis continue to reverberate across the globe in ways that that not even the most prescient could have imagined. On top of the ruined lives and misery inflicted upon tens of millions of Americans, many of whom will never recover economically to pre-recession levels, the heedless actions of these financial institutions and their principles have unleashed a storm of violent nationalism and xenophobia in Europe, the product of the EU's failed attempt to address the crisis through fiscal austerity. Far-right parties are widely expected to increase their power and influence across the continent as stubborn double-digit unemployment threatens to consign an entire generation of young Europeans to stagnation and poverty. The sociological effects of the Great Recession are incalculable, as is the cascading effect such an economic calamity on the generations to follow. And here again, I guess, Rakoff being quoted here, the rightist parties will campaign primarily on the basis of the European Union, uh, on the basis of opposition to the European Union. Oh, I imagine this is probably not Rakoff here. What are they linking to? Globalresearch.ca, the rise of the European far right. Uh, okay, yeah, the uh, link is rather far above the block quote. So I got a little confused here, but I think that's what we're talking about here. So uh, let's see. The, the rightist parties will campaign primarily on the basis of opposition to the EU, in most instances posing as opponents of austerity measures imposed by the EU throughout Europe. By shifting somewhat from their usual preoccupation with immigration and Islam, they hope to capitalize on popular hostility to the EU and its austerity agenda. The mainstream political parties of the official left, as well as the right, are politically responsible for a situation in which the far right can strike such a pose, since the entire political establishment is implicated in the savage attacks that have been inflicted on Europe's workers since the financial crash of 2008. Good point. And another link, this time to McClatchy, for far right hate crimes creep back. That's the name uh, of the article from which this comes. There are increasing concerns across Europe that what was once considered far-right and racist is moving toward mainstream political thought, 
Anti-immigration agendas have led to increased worry from immigrant communities across the European Union. In recent weeks, a new study that has shown, has shown at the same time, concerns among Jews of a resurgence of anti-Semitism are strong and growing. Now back to D'Artagnan's commentary. The effects of this artificial, completely avoidable economic cataclysm on the entire world were so profound and the consequences so radical, the true ends will likely not manifest themselves for decades. Whatever rough beast is likely to arise from the ashes of a transformed Europe is probably not going to be to our liking. The reputations and comfort of a few persons in the U.S. government simply pales in comparison to the amount of harm done here. If Rakoff is right and the reluctance by the Justice Department to prosecute is out of fear of putting our government on trial, then the only rejoinder is that the government and the people responsible for creating this disaster deserves to share the blame along with the corporate officers and CEOs who actually turned a blind eye to fraud. If we fail to hold those responsible to account, there will be no exp expectation of any accounting in the future, and the process will certainly repeat itself as more and more opportunities to ar arise to package and transfer vast sums of wealth for the benefit of a tiny, detached, and untouchable group of people. The failure of our society to credibly assign responsibility to those whose unbridled greed caused the financial crisis will be remembered not just as a human failing, but as one of the greatest failures of democracy itself. Well, uh, okay, well, very interesting. Uh, and it's, it's punctuated at the end by a clip of Inside Job, uh, I guess, an analysis uh, a documentary of the financial crisis of 2008. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you something. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that uh, the driving factor here is the unwillingness to implicate the government in all of this. I I'm not sure it even gets that. I'm sure that CEOs would attempt to take it that way, but I think that's probably relatively easily deflected in court. I mean, uh, the system, you know, for all its fault, is set up to uh, shield government actors from liability in most cases anyway. And I think it would be a relatively easy thing to defend against to say, well, I was only doing what I thought the government wanted to incentivize with this. Uh, to which end I would say, well, see, we're here charging you. You're indicted under certain federal statutes, uh, which were created and adopted for the purpose of weeding out uh, the overzealous, let's say, pursuit of what you believed the government wanted to incentivize from what the government actually wanted to incentivize. If there were no statute in place delineating between the two, we would not be here. I wouldn't have had any statute under which to charge you. Now, we may yet decide that the line is too blurred, but that's for the judge and jury to decide. But in the meantime, the reason we're here is because the government actually wanted to incentivize up to this, and you took it beyond this up to that. And we think that is the problem. And in any case, the decision makers inside the government are shielded from liability, not just through sovereign immunity, but... Uh, thanks to the speech and debate clause of the Constitution as well. So I am not 100% sure that you're really going to see the government dangerously implicated. You might embarrass some people uh, who maybe passed laws that were too broad and too vague in what they were deregulating, but I don't know that you would necessarily uh, find yourself... Uh, inexorably drawn to the conclusion that they needed to go to jail as well. You might be able to build a case against them if they also got an enormous amount of campaign contributions beyond the point where it was legally justifiable from the people who benefited most from these acts of fraud. I suppose you could try and build some kind of case against that, but that would be a different case. And one that would probably, if they were anywhere close to uh, meeting the ethical expectations of campaign finance law would probably let those guys off the hook anyway. 
So I don't know. I think he makes some good points, and I think he makes some excellent points about the far-reaching reverberations of the financial crisis, uh, which argue as good reasons why some prosecutions ought to happen. But how you jump to governmental liability, and especially personal liability for specific government actors, not so sure that's really a huge risk. It might be the risk that people lean on when looking for reasons not to enter into prosecutions of other people, private actors. But uh, I don't think it leads inexorably to uh, the the implication of particular governmental actors. Hmm. So uh, yeah, I'll take that with a grain of salt. Let's say that. Uh, let's see, some other interesting things that uh, came up. Oh, you probably saw some analysis of this over the end of, or the middle of the week, and I, I guess uh, coming out of last weekend and into the middle of this week. Uh, I know David Neer and some of the other Daily Coast Elections guys had picked up on this but a lot of discussion about uh, uh, proportional representation, um, I guess, as between red and blue districts. Uh, but a lot of this came out of this analysis that I picked up from Josh Tauberer's blog. Um, and, and this was sort of an interesting fact. I don't know how long I can spend on this one, but uh, I thought I'd throw that one out. Josh Tauberer picks this up. 50%, did you know this one? 50% of the U.S. population lives in 1% of the land area. Now, Josh was using this as an interesting argument on Twitter, saying, you know, the, the, the case for uh, redrawing or reconsidering the way we use the red and blue congressional district maps, right? You know, there's all kinds of crazy different ways of drawing these things or weighting the size of different... Uh, congressional districts, but if you just take them as their map, the geographical map of them, and color them red or blue based on who occupies the seat, it makes it look like this, the, the middle of the country is enormously red and the coastal elites are these tiny pockets and that the country is overwhelmingly red and that blue is just barely hanging on. But then you know, of course, from hearing it uh, here and elsewhere, that many more people voted for Democrats in the congressional elections than for Republicans. And yet the majority of the House is Republican. And the map makes it look like, oh, gosh, the whole country is Republican. And the real minorities, I guess this is what leads to uh, things like Glenn Beck believing when he says, we surround them. They do, you surround it. You surround us very loosely. It's a very porous border. You know, you know uh, the definition, typically speaking of, of surrounding people in, in the context uh, like he's using it, means we can't escape. But if we can walk through miles and miles of unguarded border, then you don't really surround us. Uh, just as, uh, you know, you complain we don't surround our own borders when it comes to the question of immigration. So 50 percent of the U.S. population lives in one percent of the land area. How do you reflect that? Well, there's all kinds of crazy different ways of drawing maps and what do they call them? Cartograms, et cetera, that can, uh, and here's another term that I don't even know what this is. A, a chloropleth map. Someone who understands that can come on the show and explain that one to us. But you're really going to have to do something, right? If you're just plain looking at geographical maps, color red and blue, you have no idea what's going on out there. And Josh does say everyone likes a good chloroplast map. Uh, if you know what it is, I'd like it. I'd like you to show me one. That is, he says, a map with regions colored according to some variable. Okay, so that's what we're actually looking at. Chloroplast map is what we actually see. I, I didn't even know it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, we know, though, that it can lead to some problems. Half the U.S. population lives in just 1% of the continental U.S. land area. One-fifth of the population, by the way, lives in just 0.28% of the land area. And if you up it even more, 95% of the population lives in just 27% of the land area. <clears throat> so really, three-quarters of the land area of the continental United States doesn't have anybody in it. Or it has, you know, less than 5% anyway. 
of the people in it. <clears throat> there are at least two problems with veridical, that is regular geographic, chloropleth maps, cor choropleth maps. In a rasterized, oh my God, Josh, <laughs> only Josh can write like this. Uh, well, Josh and uh, our Daily Coast Elections vertical, they, they understand this stuff. And a rasterized, that's why we have them, so we can explain it to this. The rasterized choropleth map, i.e. one that has finite resolution, right? Entire cities can get squashed into a single pixel with the result that information is lost. So if you're looking at a standard map of the United States divided up by congressional districts, colored red or blue, you can miss entire districts, entire cities with multiple districts in them. New York City, for instance. Yeah, you only see that sort of pointed out in the map by a line drawn out into the ocean. It says, oh, by the way, over here is New York City. Well, you know, there's multiple districts in there. And those have just as many people in them, each one that you can't even see, as any of those gigantic ones, like Wyoming, which is one district. Huge swath of red. But there are 10 times more Democrats in the squashed single pixel that you only see pointed out with a little arrow out in the ocean. So as he points out, entire cities can get squashed into a single pixel with the result that information is lost. A substantial portion of the information that the map is trying to show probably doesn't even appear if the variation occurs where the people are. And more familiar veridical maps can misrepresent the aggregate. Individuals in low-density areas are given more space on the map than individuals in high-density areas, biasing aggregate inferences toward the value of individuals in low-density areas. Coloring a map by district, like by county or congressional district, runs into the same problem. The smallest 50% of the 433 congressional districts in the continent of the United States occupy just 5% of the land area. Six congressional districts, all in New York City, are smaller than one pixel in a typically sized map. We're typically sized, by the way, equals 650 pix by 410. When map data falls below the resolution of the map itself, one should be very concerned. It's like tossing out arbitrary data because these data points really aren't showing up at all. That's considered academic fraud, by the way, when the data is shown in the form of a table. I'm not sure why we think it's okay in map form. And you remember what kind of problems, by the way, throwing out data arbitrarily can lead to. Like, for instance, the idea that austerity is a good idea because there's some point at which sovereign debt becomes a drag on the economy. Do we remember that happening recently? Well, it's also, by the way, mostly the urban population that gets squeezed into a small area. This is particularly concerning for politically themed maps since the urban population leans left. All six of those too small to be seen New York districts are currently represented by Democrats, for instance. The Republican held congressional districts are, on average, 2.7 times larger than Democrat that are democratic held districts having despite having equal weight in congress and so take up disproportionate space on a veridical map or vertical map i'm sorry i was saying veridical but it's vertical but not v e r t but v e r d i c a l the same is likely true by county too if we were to look at presidential election results consider how much space on a map is taken up by essentially unpopulated land these maps are also inefficient representations of the data. They give space to meaningless geographies while skipping meaningful ones. It's really time we stopped using, oh, and here it is now with, a, with an I, veridical maps. So maybe it is. The other one was a typo. Veridical maps to show population data. I get that cartograms are hard to construct and hard to read, but I would rather have no map at all than a map that misrepresents the data it purports to show. And then he has some detailed data in a table form showing land area as a function of population. That is interesting. So 5% of the population 
lives in just 0.02% of the land area, all the way up to 100%. Uh, of course, 100% of us live in 99.62% of the land area. That's not all that helpful. But the stuff that I think is really amazing in the middle here is, uh, yeah, 95% of the population is accounted for in just about a quarter of the land mass. Very interesting and worth thinking about and, uh, you know, how you solve it, I don't know. But, yeah, try explaining that one to, you know, your teabagger pal if you have any. You know, oh, well, yeah, you're showing me this map and think you surround us and you think the country is overwhelmingly right-leaning. But then again, if you, yeah, these veridical maps, you see, they don't make any, right. Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know how you can convince people otherwise if they're sort of wrapped up in their own delusions. But that's always been a problem. All right. Uh, what other interesting things have we got uh, hanging around here? There's plenty to talk about, really. Um, oh, yes, I wanted to get to this one. I mentioned this one on Monday and uh, thought that you should read it. I don't know if you did. If you didn't, I'll take care of that for you right now. Fifteen minutes left in the program gives us about enough time to discuss this uh, as a start, I would say. Uh, but I talked about it at home like I do with everything. I talk about how, what do, I, what do you want for dinner? Half an hour discussion, even if I already know. So I don't know how we'll get through this one. We'll give it a shot. But remember this one, when life hacking is really white privilege. I thought this was just interesting. Makes for good weekend fodder. Think about it. Go find it. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you the links to it so you can take a look at it too. Uh, this written by, uh, well, well, you know, uh, I think we have just a Twitter handle for this one. Let's see if I can flip back and get the... Uh, the, the full story. It's over at medium.com, by the way, where you can take a look at it. The Twitter handle uh, is attached to this as the author, Jen Dezuria. Good question as to how you would pronounce such a name. But, well, rather than uh, worry about that, we'll get to the substance of this thing, and you can go and take a look. Uh, at any rate, it starts off with an anecdote, which, as you know, is not data. The line at the post office was 18 people deep. I'd been waiting a while and was thinking about something I'd read, that in Europe, public services are for the public, meaning everyone, whereas in the U.S., public services are for those who can't afford a private alternative. Interesting. And hence the wait. And also now that relevant to what Greg mentioned and what everybody is talking about today about the UPS and FedEx backlog in delivering Christmas packages, right? UPS and FedEx are for people who can't stand the wait of waiting four days possibly, maybe even longer, for a package to be delivered by the U.S. Postal Service. I want to pay extra for overnight delivery. We all understand this. But there you have it. So here we are. And public services are for the people who can't afford a private alternative here in the United States. I looked around and noticed that no one among the patrons or the employees was a white man. At the Hanover Street post office, a half a block off Wall Street, that was noticeable. Or notable, she says. A white man walked in. Uh Uh-oh. Look out. He surveyed the line, and I can feel this happening, too, as she's describing it. You know what's going on. He surveyed the line and confidently jetted past it over to an employee pushing a wheeled bin across the floor. He put his hand on the employee's back, and that's in italics, by the way, and that is an interesting thing. He puts his hand on the employee's back. He said, hey, buddy, can you do me a favor? I just have this one thing. Well, that didn't sit well with Jen. And it's, uh, by the way, uh, the the Twitter handle for this person is Jen, J-E-N-D, Ziura. Z-I-U-R-A. I don't know whether her last name is Ziura or her middle initial is D Ziura. I have no idea. But at any rate, you can find her there. So that's interesting, right? Hey, buddy, can you do me a favor? I just have this one thing. And you know the feeling, right? I just have this one thing and there's this whole long line. But that's the problem, right? I also have this one thing, I thought. And this line is for people who have one or more things. And uh, a good uh, good question here as to whether or not the punctuation, the interjection at the end, the name she calls this guy, is 
doable for we act radio so i'll have to email with them and ask them how do they feel about that which we will abbreviate by saying d bag <laughs> i don't know whether that's a pass i think that's probably slipped by in most cases over the radio but anyway yeah this whole line is for people who have one or more things you can't just skip it and you have no right to ask a favor that Again, and I think this is still okay. That dicks over 18 people uninvolved in granting that favor. Interesting exercise in collective thought there. Hmm. Right? Uh, I just have this one favor. Yeah, well, that's the one thing you want. But the guy, the, right, the postal employee, even if he does you the favor, 18 people get screwed by it. You should ask every single one of them, can you ditch in line? Fortunately... Jen continues here. The mystified employee, who was not white, by the way, sent him to the back of the line. I gloated. I tweeted. I've met that guy before. We all have. Unless you are that guy and you're like a fish who doesn't realize that water is wet. So here's a little snap of her tweet here. Post office line equals 18 people. None white men. One white Wall Street guy comes in, tries to jump the line by asking worker for a favor, quotes, Rage. And I can I understand that. Now, this is interesting. James Altucher, and I don't know whether, how he pronounces that last name. It's A L T U C H E R. Altucher. Alto, it's probably not Altucher. Altucher, does he say, or does he just say Altucher? Recently posted a short piece on Quora entitled How to Break All the Rules and Get Everything You Want. Very interesting uh, because it's the sort of thing that in isolation you would see it as relatively harmless self-help guru, life coach, life hacking crap. But that's entirely the point of the single one. Life hacking becomes white privilege. So it's linked and you can take a look at it if you can follow the link to this piece. But he says in his piece, Altiker, whose Wikipedia page contains the phrase, quote, ran a fund of hedge funds, get it? Now you know who you're talking about? Recounts the tale of taking his daughter out for a fashion show and some ping pong. I didn't even realize that going out for some ping pong was a thing, but I, and then I remembered, New York City, yes it is, ping pong clubs. And I know that my brothers, in fact, uh, have played there when they were living, both of them in the city used to hang out and go and play ping pong all the time. One of them was really pretty good at it too. But, that's neither here nor there. He wants to take his daughter out for a fashion show and some ping pong. Sure, why not? Take the kids out, right? When he's not on the list at the fashion show, which is already raising eyebrows. Okay, so he's not on the list. A friend had promised to add him. He manipulates his way in. And I'm sure he's thinking, huge win, right? And the whole piece, as it turns out, Altucker's piece is all about how he really, uh, you know, I mean, really, honestly, what kind of rules should prevent you from playing ping pong? Come on, it's just ping pong. So he manipulates his way in. When the ping pong venue is closed due to a private event, he manipulates his way into that and plays ping pong at someone else's party. And of course, people never think of it that way when they're trying to do it, right? I just, I told my daughter, I mean, what's the big deal? So James, so he says, this is interesting. So he, he gets into the ping pong party. He believes his fun evening provides a lesson for us all. Don't break the laws. Don't kill people. Don't steal. But most other rules can be bent. James Altiker thinks he has written an article about, quote, getting everything you want. He has actually written an article about white privilege and probably class privilege and male privilege and maybe some others. You know that fun game you play at Chinese restaurants where you add in bed to everyone's fortune? It's not that much fun, but Jen knows the game, and so do you. You will achieve great success this year in bed. Hilarious. Anyway, uh, I have a related suggestion for Altiker's article. Just add if you're white or because I'm white to each generalization or anecdote in the article. For instance, when I, I find, Altiker writes, when you act confused but polite, then people want to help if you're white. See, if you're white. People want to help is where he says the end of the sentence belongs. There was a line behind me. I wasn't fighting or angry, so there was no reason for anyone to get angry at me because I'm white. I wasn't fighting or angry, so there was no reason to, for anyone to get angry at me. Really now? 
You peacefully barged your way into a fashion show in the same town in which Forrest Whitaker peacefully attempted to buy yogurt with actual money. Guess who fared better? There are many people in this country for whom it is exceedingly dangerous to assume that if you aren't angry, there's no reason for anyone to be angry at you. Here is one of them, a picture of Renisha McBride, recently shot to death outside of Detroit for having the audacity of knocking on a nearby door when her car broke down, but in the middle of the night, and she was black, so therefore, oops, the gun accidentally went off and shot her to death. See also Jonathan Farrell, the former football player killed by police after seeking help following a car wreck. But please, let's continue. So Altiker writes again, When the lights started to dim, the ushers waved to Molly, his daughter. There was an extra seat near the front. Let us also note, while Altiker is pro trying to provide a delightful evening for his daughter, the entire setup of this evening is that his friend Nathan has gotten him on the list for a fashion show, although it later turns out he's not actually on the list. Altiker's response is, what? He drops the Wall Street Journal's name. He writes for the Wall Street Journal, you see. He does work there, but he doesn't cover fashion. He's not going to cover the show. So this story has already begun with Altiker trying to nab great seats that, if they belonged to anyone, rightly belonged to fashion journalists who would write about the show, or celebrities who would bring cachet to the fashion line. The posture of taking begins before the story even starts. And it's amazing, and there's some extra tweets in there quoted from people who are tweeting back and forth with her about that postal worker situation. <laughs> and you should take a look at those. But let's move on to the ping-pong part of the story. Altiker and his daughter are told they cannot rent a table because the Bank of America has rented out the entire place. Now, that's ordinarily annoying enough, but he makes it even more annoying by actually finding a way to get in. But isn't he the hero triumphing in all this? <clears throat> well, not if you take a good look at what's really happening. And we'll play the outro music and take you out with this story. He says in his piece, I said, can't we just walk around and watch all the players? And they let us in. Now imagine trying to do that, right? Now she adds, of course, because we're white. Can't we just come in and look around and watch the other players? Now who would believe that you were just going to go in and just watch other people playing? Well, I don't know. If you're white and dressed right, I guess so. Now he goes on to say, I saw a table labeled Bank of America that was empty and had two rackets left on it. So Molly and I played ping pong for the next hour. Nobody noticed because we're white, right? Imagine just finding your way in and, hey, I'm just somebody, some other person who happens to be another color. I'm playing at this reserved ping pong table for the Bank of America employees, but all of a sudden everyone can automatically tell, hey, wait a minute, that guy might not belong. And why? Because he doesn't look like he belongs very interesting. Nobody noticed because you happen to look a lot like other Bank of America employees. Or maybe people did notice and they were annoyed and that's why someone eventually asked you to leave. Can you imagine that? And of course he was only asked to leave because some, oh well, you know, someone else wanted to play. Not you were stealing ping pong. Although admittedly you were stealing from the Bank of America and I applaud you for that. Alright, we'll take the weekend off. We'll talk more about this. You should read this article. I'll see you from on Monday. Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman.